Hello, AP Bio. So let's pick up on our notes where we left off. We were talking about the conditions of the Hardy-Weinberg uh, principle and or the principles of a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, a population that is, the allele frequencies are not changing over time. So it's, recall that it's a null hypothesis and um, it's saying that there are no evolutionary forces present. So the question is, what we're talking about right now, and what we started to talk about in class on Friday was, uh, what are evolutionary forces? So the first three that we talked about were um, random mutation, that's one evolutionary force, and then a second evolutionary force. So obviously that's gonna change allele frequencies. Allele frequencies are gonna change and shift toward mate preferences. That's why sexual selection is an allele frequency changer. Natural selection changes allele frequencies because in response to the environment, some uh, traits or some alleles are advantages and some are disadvantages. And when the environment changes, those uh, the advantages and disadvantages can change. And then we talked about a little bit about how those uh, changes occur, looking at the phenotypic variation in a population. Sometimes we get uh, shifts to in one direction, we call that a directional selection. Sometimes we get uh, reinforcement of the most common phenotype, uh, that's stabilizing selection. And we talked about disruptive selection when we get two phenotypes or at least two phenotypes emerging. Now I'm gonna talk about balancing selections. And we have two examples of balancing selections in your notes. So this time I'm gonna try a little bit different uh, uh, format where I'm just gonna tell you where to go in your notes and, and you can take notes as opposed to me giving you my notes uh, so to see if you can just listen to what I'm saying and you write down what you think is important. So the balancing selections, two instances where we have what are called balancing selections are the heterozygous advantage and frequent, uh, frequency dependent selection. I talked about heterozygous advantage in, in some sections and not, so I apologize if this feels a little bit like review. But the heterozygous advantage just means that heterozygous individuals have a selective advantage. And the reason it's considered a balancing selection is it preserves otherwise unfavorable alleles. So you get multiple alleles being preserved in the gene pool because being a heterozygote is good. So you obviously have to have two different, that's the definition of a heterozygous, the heterozygous genotype. Uh, so if we look at uh, an example of the heterozygous advantage, a classic example is uh, sickle cell anemia, where we have, a high, this is showing the, um, the, the sickle allele frequency. It increases in areas where we have also an increase in the presence of uh, the mosquitoes that are the vector of malaria. So the plasmodium um, parasite is what causes um, um, sickle cell anemia, I mean, pardon me, no, 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 causes malaria. And if you are heterozygous um, for the sickle trait, the plasmodium doesn't like those sickled cells. And so you don't, if you're big N, big N for normal red blood cells, um, because you have two, uh, all of your hemoglobin um, proteins are normal, then you'll die from malaria. If you have little and little n, then you get sickle disease. So the heterozygotes have the advantage where they are going to have, if you look at them at the cellular level, they're gonna have half their cells are gonna be blood, red blood cells are gonna be normal, half will be sickle. So they'll be able to deliver enough oxygen because they have enough normal red blood cells, but they also uh, will not have enough red blood cells, red, juicy red blood cells for plasmodium to set up shop. And it's called their parasite load is kept relatively low and they can survive malaria. So they get a lesser infection essentially. And so that preserves um, um, the two alleles in the population. So if we look at people uh, that are of descent from these areas of Africa and Asia here, we see a much higher instance of this, the, uh, the beta globin allele that codes for sickling disease. Uh, another uh, example of a balancing selection is frequency dependent selection. So what I do want you to do is click on these links here and you can watch these videos and learn about what these are. This is gonna talk about sickle cell anemia. This talks, talks about being left-handed. It's a really interesting video about why, if, if there's an advantage to one versus the other, uh, being right-handed, for example. Why do we ha continue to see the left-handed uh, phenotype in populations? Um, and it, it'll talk a little bit about that. But essentially, in frequency-dependent selection, what we get 
is you get the frequency, you can put this in your notes, the frequency of one phenotype depends on the frequency of another. So essentially, the rare phenotypes are an advantage. So if something is an advantage, think about it like this in frequency dependent selection. If it's an advantage, it will increase in frequency. But in frequency dependent selection, as it increases, it decreases in as, as an advantage. And when it becomes the quote unquote norm or the more frequent allele, it's not an advantage anymore, then it's a disadvantage. So when frequency increases, it shifts to a disadvantage. A classic example are the, to the chiclet fish, um, the left jawed fish versus the right jawed fish. You're gonna read about, be, watch about being left-handed here. Uh, also the flu virus strains uh, is a classic example of frequency dependent selection. Essentially what happens in the flu virus is we have different strains of the virus, when we vax, we look for scientists, epidemiologists, people that study disease, they look for the most common strains that are going to be prevalent that year and people get vaccinated. So the most common strains are selected against because people are vaccinated against those. But the least common strains have plenty of hosts, right? Because there's a lot of resource for them and they, those people can't get the the most common strains, but then they their their uh, frequency increases. But when their frequency increases, we vaccinate against those, or because so many people have it, they have natural immunity against those strains. Um, in any case, so you can see how uh, the immunity, whether it's immunity from vaccination or natural immunity, um, is going to decrease the 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 those common strains. Uh, anyway, so that's frequency dependent selection. And in both of those cases, that's going to change allele frequencies. Again, we call them balancing selection. So it's, it's a, it, to, both of those are examples of natural selection, but it's a balancing selection where you get a balance of allele frequencies and populations because of advantages, in this case, of the heterozygotes, and in this case, uh, of a rare allele. A rare allele is an advantage and a common allele is a disadvantage. Okay, uh, now let's look at another uh, allele frequency game changer. Uh, let's look at the concept of genetic drift. So we're here in your notes. Let's go scroll down and we're here in genetic drift. So genetic drift is when we have allele frequency changes from chance. A chance event that alters allele frequencies. That's what, what a genetic drift is. And the, the allele frequency change is not just that it's more fit, it's just different because it happens by chance. And a smaller population is going to have different allele frequencies. So we have a chance event that alters allele frequencies. Let's look at two examples of uh, what genetic, what results has, uh, what happens as a result of genetic drift. In the founder effect, we have a small number of individuals that are isolated from the population uh, by chance. So here you have the general population. You can see allele frequency here. And then you have a small number of individuals here. Well, these are three different small populations made from this large population. And you can see these have different allele frequencies, but they're by chance not necessarily by something in the environment or not by something in the environment. So you've got different allele frequencies, but it doesn't have anything to do with being a better fit from the environment. Classic example of the founder effect are the Amish. So the Amish started as a group of uh, people that emigrated from Europe uh, in the mid 1700s, a group of 200 people. Today in the United States and Canada, we have half a million people, all from that same gene pool super weird allele frequencies, different allele frequencies in those populations that have nothing to do with natural selection. So you get accumulation of rare alleles because we had 200 people all mate for years and years, since the men, hundreds of years, and now we have a quarter of a million people. Oh, ew, a little bit ew, a lot of consanguineous mating, right? Um, okay, and in the, in the, but, but it was just by chance that those people, I mean, those people have shared the same beliefs, but it didn't have anything to do with their genetics, right? And those people came to the United States and they have different allele frequencies in their population than we do in, uh, in the greater human population. Um, in the bottleneck effect, we have a sudden change that's in an environment 
uh, that drastically reduces the population. Here's a nice graphic that showed it, shows that. So we have, it's called the bottleneck, and this shows a, why it's called that. Here's the bottleneck right there. Here's the, the allele frequencies in a population. And then we have, you can say that this is the original population right here. You could label it as that. And then here, this is this represents the sudden change. Something happens, shazam. So what could the sudden change be? I don't know, a fire or a flood, some type of a natural disaster, or all of a sudden, their population is bam. Uh, not something like a drought where organisms have to be able to respond to the environment, but something more like a fire that just, just destroys everything in a particular area, and you're left with a, a I mean, everything dies from fire, right? Um, or a flood, right, and, and on land. Um, and then here's the new population. You can see it has a, a, a new allele frequency. So both of these are examples of genetic drift. Now, if we look at what that might look like here, we have a situation of, and you can click on these and watch uh, about those two different uh, specific uh, examples of genetic drift. But here you can see what it looks like. So here's the main population. And then some of them by chance get stepped on, and then you have a different allele frequency here. So the the the, the key word in genetic drift is it, the allele frequency changes by chance, uh, as opposed to in these, it's changing because of random mutation. Here it's changing because of sexual selection. Here allele frequencies are changing because the environment is putting pressure on allele frequencies on, on allele uh, current allele frequencies, and then here. Uh, it's totally by chance. The last allele frequency uh, game changer or allele frequency changer is called gene flow. And so unlike genetic drift, the word drift even sort of uh, implies the concept of chance, right? Drift, you're just like not in any specific direction. Uh, I might go here, maybe go there. So it's there's a chance element to it. In genetic flow, we have uh, a specific direction, and it it's the transfer of alleles in and out of populations. So here we have the the transfer of alleles in and out of populations. That's what gene flow is, and it's just changes in allele frequencies due to the entrance or exit of alleles from different populations. So from fragmented populations, and really in gene flow, the new genes are acting just like mutations because there are new alleles that are coming into that population from another population. Um, and if we think about what gene flow might look like in a population, so we've got this big mountain range that's separating these two populations of bird X, population A and population B. And for whatever reason, this bird can fly over this mountain. And then he comes here and he introduces his blue allele into this red population. And we get uh, a, a directional change in allele frequencies over time. Okay. So that is it for now. We're going to talk about human evolution on Monday in class, but those are the five uh, allele frequency changers in populations, and the Hardy-Weinberg principle assumes that none of those are present. Okay, I hope that was helpful, and uh, that's it for now.